I recognize many of the faces out here, so I'm Gene Hines, and some of you um, I've spoken with about various things. So by way of a show of hands, how many of you are already working in labs with animals? So about two-thirds of you. Okay. So I've changed this presentation a little bit, so hopefully if you have seen some of it before in any capacity, um, you'll be entertained yet again uh, with something new. Uh, so yes, I do have a background in comparative animal endocrinology. I've done about 20 years of research with animals, just trying to study why it is that makes them do the wacky things they do. And of course, animals are a whole lot more special than we are, in my view, because they um, survive in a very harsh environment sometimes without the aid of the shelter and amenities that we have. You could argue that maybe we're smarter because we invented those things, but those animals have a lot of really neat adaptations. And I got into all this business because I uh, really just wanted to see the huge variety of science that goes on instead of just studying in a lot of detail um, my specific research program. And I did human research for about three years as well, so I've seen that side. And I can tell you that the paperwork for animals is a whole lot more than the paperwork for humans. And the big reason for that is why. We talked about it. There's no informed consent for animals. So it's a really big issue that we take very seriously to make sure that what you're doing with animals or proposing to do is done appropriately. So let's talk about how this works. And uh, I always like to go through this. If you answer yes to any of these questions or someone you know or care about or maybe you don't care about answers yes to any of these questions, then what you're about to hear is uh, directly relevant to you. And as soon as I leave here today, I'm going to get my H1N1 shot. So I have animals to thank for that. And I have two little kids in elementary school, and I can't register them unless I've turned in their blue sheet, indicating they've had their immunizations also. So another way that animals impact us every day. So, um, and again, you guys are the target audience for H1N1 uh, shots. They're available at Blazer Hall if you need them for free. It's a benefit, and I'm not here to pitch that program necessarily. But it was all developed with animals. Any meat eaters out here? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, me too. I had a double helping at my kids' Thanksgiving school lunch today. Um, why can we eat meat? Because it's healthy. There are USDA, FDA programs that keep those agricultural stocks healthy and allow us to enjoy that part of our life. Have scheduled or unscheduled doctor appointments. That's pretty much all of us. God forbid we do have the unscheduled ones, but accidents happen. How do those docs and medical professionals get their abilities so fine-tuned to treat us and have us live long and happy lives? Um, through research with animals, as I'll show you. They're not practicing on humans, so to speak. Uh, who's got pets? I've got three great big dogs and a bunch of little bitty fish. And they're all healthy because I take them to the vet. Well, not the fish. And uh, the vets know what they know because they have been to vet school and practice on animals. Again, animals contributing to them. Anyone take medications? I took my little gummy vitamin today. Okay. I'm sure there's, well, probably not this fine, healthy, young group of uh, folks here, but almost everybody takes a pill or two a day, whether it's uh, to stay on track or if it's your recreational pastime, but we won't go there. So all those things were developed. For, uh, for us through use with animals. And these cheapo Walmart glasses I'm wearing because my 45-year-old eyes can't see so well developed through the use of animals. We have a tree shrew colony on campus where they actually uh, study myopia in those animals. And it's sort of interesting. You see, it's kind of like going to Disney. You see these tree shrews, which are basically like a squirrel hopped up on steroids. And they, they have goggles on, and they sort of bend their, their lenses with these goggles to study them. And they're going around like Mr. Limpet, so to speak. Um, so it's kind of funny. I'm not making fun of them. I'm being very respectful. But that's how they contribute to uh, us in every day. There's lots of folks out here wearing glasses or contacts. So is there anyone out here who couldn't answer yes about any of these questions or doesn't know someone who answered yes? All the hands are down, OK? Either you're embarrassed, asleep, or really that's what the case is. So it impacts all of us every day. So what's new in the news as of late? Swine flu, everybody run for the hills. Um, this is a little bit older slide that I put together just to show some perspective. Um, back in June, you can see that the colored map over there tells you um, the, uh, the widespread um, nature, which even got more widespread here last month uh, as far as the, the darker 
colors meaning there's more um, impact of flu. And as of today in the news, there's just over a thousand deaths attributed to H1N1. So um, why are we keeping that at bay? Again, I'm not trying to be an alarmist, is because we have these vaccines developed and medical professionals to deal with it. So research at our fine institution. You guys are all in grad school or postdocs of some sort. You wouldn't be here had you not chosen UAB for its reputation, or maybe you got a free ride or something, and that's why you're here. But anyway, we're all here because it's a good place to do research. Okay? And uh, it's recognized the globe over for that. And we have both basic and applied programs. Now, most of you are probably in applied research. Is there anyone here from the School of Natural Sciences and Mathematics, or what used to be called that? That end of campus. Probably not, but that's from whence I came. I was a marine biologist, so I studied basic science, which is no real direct application or immediate application, but eventually it lends to itself to biomedical research, which is, of course, what the two-thirds of you are holding your hands up. You guys do. So the role of animals. So I like to throw up lots of different pictures here. Um, these are all pictures of types of animals we have here on campus. They play an important role, um, both basic and applied research uh, and teaching depend on animals. Yes, humans and animals both benefit. Again, agricultural animals benefit by being healthy. Our pets benefit by being healthy. Who here watches the dog whisperer? Man, that guy's, he's got it going on. Uh, so it's not just physical health, it's also emotional health. That's very important for the animals in research or your pets. And would you have guessed that this uh, figure is at 69%? How many people here, and it better be at least the two-thirds of you that held your hands up, how many of you um, believe that it's appropriate to use animals in research? So more than the two-thirds, okay? Um, as you get closer and closer to the places where research is done with animals, that number goes closer and closer to 100. And that's because those people are more informed and they're generally better able to deal with the truth of it or see the truth of it. Now, the animal rights side, as Professor Kincaid pointed out, has a very important part in all of this. And I'll show you how that plays in. There's obviously two sides to every story. Um, I had, was invited out to dinner one night two years ago by the local chapter of PETA. And that's, of course, one of the animal rights groups that's more extreme. And I went there. Through, uh, through advice and okay from UAB legal counsel office. They said, just make sure you go to a public place. <laughs> and uh, so we went to uh, PF Chang's at the summit and we had a big table set up and I'm not gonna get too far off on this, but we had a nice lunch or a nice dinner, a few drinks to talk about this topic. And they just came at me with both barrels blasting, just asking all these questions. And I said, whoa, 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 I'm, you know, I'm not here for that. Let's have a discussion. And uh, by the end of the night, we were all shaking hands trading business cards, and I gave them an open invitation anytime they wanted to, to come and tour our facilities. Um, one of them has taken up on it, but you know, it's that type of open door policy we want to have. I mean, we're not going to let anyone in the facilities, certainly not unescorted, but we're not ashamed of what we do, and we're very proud of it, and any of you here who have not seen behind the lab door, so to speak, the invitation is open for you anytime. Just um, contact me through your professor you, you, or look me up in the UIB directory. We have a very open door policy as long as you go through it in the appropriate manner. So people always ask, um, that's a uh, owl monkey in the bottom right hand corner, and we do have, um, they're an excellent model for studying pediatric brain cancer, for example. Uh, little piglets up top there. Uh, some pet dogs there just to drive point, uh, the point home that it's not all about research animals, it's about our companion animals as well. And if you're into studying male pattern baldness, you study the nude mouse. <laughs> That's not true. Anyone, there's probably some of you out here who study the nude mouse. Um, it's just uh, an immunocompromised animal and if you knock out the gene responsible for the uh, immune system in these animals, it's very closely related to the gene for hair. So they're very easy to see. Um, if anyone here has ever seen a nude rat, you know, a rat is not just a big mouse. So their genetics are a little bit different. If you knock out the gene for the uh, immune system in rats, you get a rat that they call a nude rat, but it has splotches of hair everywhere. And it's about the damn ugliest animal I've ever seen. <laughs> but don't tell them that. You must be respectful. Next two slides are your history lesson for the past year. And I'm not going to read through it. You can kind of glance over it and see 
um, how this variety of animals have been used in biomedical research and what medical advances they've gained. Again, just focusing on the medical advances uh, and not so much agricultural or other quality of life issues. Um, you know, you can look through here. There's um, polio, for example, rodents and primates, uh, cancer chemotherapy, many species, and of course you've probably all have studied in your physiology um, courses the uh, role that dogs played in studying diabetes and insulin. So the last half of last century kind of went this way. Uh, a lot of people kind of look at this and say, well, that's got to be a typo. 1980s artificial heart porpoises. Well, why not? How are porpoises similar to us? Starts with an M. No, they're not mean. <laughs> they're mammals. Okay, so you might not consider that certain animals are appropriate for studying human issues, but that's why we have veterinarians and qualified scientists to help you select the appropriate animal model. Um, so throughout here you mainly see uh, mainly rodents, mice and rats, but lots of other types of animals. And I put question marks for this century because we don't know where we're going with these. I mean, we do have a clear path to reduce the number of animals we use, replace it with computer models, in vitro methods, as Professor Kincaid pointed out, you know, the goal is not to just use as many animals as we can. Uh, the reality is we'll always need to use them because there's nothing like the real deal when you're studying something. But we are basically leveling off in terms of the total numbers of animals we use in research these days. It's not going up and up and up. It's leveling off. And what is going up is there's more mice being used. Um, and it's largely because of the genetically manipulated mice. That is really the big thing on the horizon these days. So, all you young whippersnappers, I kind of gave this away a little bit, but um, you can tell this is an old picture for a couple reasons. Anyone want to holler out? Well, look at the getup those nurses are wearing, right? Um, that is a polio ward in the 1950s, and those uh, big cylindrical objects are iron lung machines. And you can see the uh, person's head sticking out there and those big rectangular objects over them are mirrors. And that's um, how people used to live before there was a vaccine developed for polio. And it, it's not a great quality of life, but they're still living. Now, thanks to animals, particularly mice and rats and the rhesus macaque, researchers have developed vaccinations so people don't have to live that way anymore. So this was way back before um, there was a polio vaccine. And so we're, the point here is quality of life. These animals, we have a lot to thank them for in terms of contributing to quality of life for people everywhere. Animals at UAB. Who hasn't been to Bartow Arena? We got that big old honking dragon. Um, would you have guessed the numbers that large? On campus, considering this is downtown Birmingham, more or less, 90,000 animals on any given day. And that doesn't mean we're using, killing, euthanizing that many animals every day. Most of these animals are in longer term studies. And we don't count every little bitty zebrafish or sea urchin embryo, but this is about what our census is of animals. And by that account, we're one of the top 10 largest by volume uh, animal research institutions in North America. So that's what you all are part of. Um, Let's throw out some other facts here. We've got a huge variety. Most of these guys are rats and mice, but we have lots of different types of animals. And if you think about the biology department, again, this is not all about research. Some of it is about teaching. And how do you teach ecology? With, uh, you're not gonna just have one mouse teaching ecology. Yeah, you might talk about hibernation in the wintertime and that particular type of mouse uh, or other types of dynamics, but ecology is all about all different types of animals and how they interact in their environment. And so we have a lot of variety of reptiles, amphibians, and other cold-blooded vertebrates um, dealing with animals. I see some of you taking notes. I'm happy to leave a copy of this with your professor if you want a copy of it, okay? So it's fun to be part of that, to see all the different types of animals. They're spread all over campus, okay? The way this campus grew up, um, we, didn't, we started with one little vivarium or building with animals. And then, you know, another building would pop up a few blocks away and then someone would build a place to keep animals there. And that was kind of before we had any controls or there any rules about how you could do things. But uh, a lot of places have it centralized where there's one big building where everyone comes and does their animal stuff there. 
at UAB, we've opted to give the researchers, you guys, the customers, the um, increased efficiency, the ease of working with the animals by having facilities spread out around campus. Makes it a little easier for you. We have about 1,200 active animal protocols at any one time. There's about 1,400 of us, about 50 of us in this room, who have our card keys activated to go in the animal facilities. And as those of you know who have your card keys activated, it doesn't get activated until you've been listed on a protocol, your mentor's protocol or your own, and that protocol's been approved. And to have it be approved, you have to go through all sorts of training and occupational health uh, enrollment and things like that to assess whether you're a suitable person to go in the animal facilities. And it's training not just in handling the type of uh, species of animal you're using, but also about some basics on rules, regulations, and ethics. And I promise I only have two data slides. I know you all are big uh, science geeks, but only two data slides today. Um, that's about typical for most major biomedical research institutions. Most of the animals are rats and mice. And I'll explain a little bit why that's, uh, that's so. But we also have a lot of other animals. They just make up a very small proportion.